Okay, uh, I think we have a good amount of customers in now, so we'll get started. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. So hi, everyone. My name is Rosemary Christian. I'm the manager of client engagement with Access AT Group. Thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar on the SolarWinds breach series um, with CyberArk. So today from CyberArk, we have Mike Roloffs. We didn't go over how to pronounce your last name, so hopefully I got that right. <laughs> That's close enough. Close enough, great. Um, so Mike is uh, currently a solutions channel engineer supporting all CyberArk partners in the United States and Canada. In this role, Mike's primary responsibility is enabling channel partners on CyberArk's technical go-to-market strategy. And this includes advocating for partner-specific technical solutions, developing and delivering partner-focused technical sales certifications and trainings, and enabling partners on new solutions offerings. So Mike has had some experience um, working with the team at CyberArk and uh, helping customers protect against this attack. So we have asked him to join us today and present and give us a little background on the attack and um, some information. So uh, we'll just continue on the next slide. If you don't know who we are, Access IT Group is the premier integrator of cybersecurity products and solutions on the East Coast. I'm not gonna read everything on here, um, but for those of you who know our professional services, we have three practice areas, cloud services, risk management services, and technical services that work together to secure our customers' environments and help protect against this new wave of cyber attacks. Our professional services practices are focused on helping customers evaluate their current cybersecurity posture through consulting and special, specialized security services. We're prepared to support our clients, and we've helped a couple of different customers already um, protect against this breach and other breaches um, in the past, and we're hoping to help them protect for future breaches and make sure they have all their security solutions in place, as well as evaluating for, you know, maturing their security posture. So with that, I will pass it over to Mike to begin presenting. Excellent. I appreciate it. So we're going to take the next, um, you know, probably 40, maybe 45 minutes. We want to leave some questions at the end, some time at the end for questions um, and kind of walk through the SolarWinds breach and how CyberArk um, could have helped to, you know, plug some of these gaps. Okay. So if you don't know, SolarWinds is an American company that develops software for business and to help manage their networks, systems, information, information technologies. Sounds fantastic. Um, but we're going to dig into the Orion software specifically, which is, you know, a monitoring and a management platform designed to simplify administration for, you know, on-prem hybrid um, SaaS environments. Okay. And so back in, I think it was um, December 8th, 2020, um, FireEye, discovered a, a supply chain attack, trojanizing SolarWinds Orion business software updates um, in order to distribute malware. Okay. After a thorough investigation, the attack revealed itself to be part of a global intrusion campaign um, utilizing you know, a supply chain attack vector. It's, it's huge. Um, and the attack itself really was uh, highly sophisticated um, extremely evasive techniques they use. Um, you know, speculation, some of the articles you read, some point to, you know, uh, a Russian nation state attack um, and really involving the group uh, Cozy Bear or APT29. Um, this campaign impacted global organizations, both public and private. However, it seemed to be that the, uh, the US government was the main interest prim primarily targeted were the uh, Department of Commerce, um, Treasury, and Homeland Security. Now, as you might imagine, with access to the Orion server and sufficient local privilege privileges, keep that in mind, they got local privileges. Um, these credentials can be extracted and decrypted from Orion's database. Um, in 2016, 
um, a security research open source a tool called Solar Flare. You can go check it out. Uh, it's still on GitHub, I think. Um, where what this does is it extracts and decrypts the password um, and that locally stored encryption keys. So you can see here in our example, we have a screenshot of the tool's output revealing domain accounts, data storage, administrative credentials, and more. Yet again, highlighting the extensive reach the threat actors gain by trojanizing that or, um, Orion update. So just from this dump here, we can clearly see the implications, implications of a compromised Orion server. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the attack flow, how Orion's code was trojanized um, and what the initial access was used for as far as we know it today. So the initial attack chain was the access Orion's code was made based on initial breach to the SolarWinds network, which at this moment we know very little about, um, at least I do. Um, although the details of the initial access and the extent of the breach isn't clear, it is clear that the threat actors were able to trojanize Orion's update code. Then the payload was added to the code remain dormant for a period of, I believe, between 12 to 14 days. And this makes it difficult to associate any suspicious update uh, activity to that update. Now, following this dormant period, the payload runs um, several reconnaissance actions, uh, operating system and security checks um, to minimize early exposure. Um, and then the payload contacts the command and control server, then starts receiving commands and instructions. At this point, the target attacked on FireEye and Microsoft actually started. And so the idea here is they went to extensive lengths, okay, um, to make sure and learn that their code mimicked what the SolarWinds code looked like. Think about that. Um, the structure of the code, the terminology, okay? Like, heck, they first added a little, and if you're a coder, you're familiar with hello world, simple code, right? It's kind of your test code, right? Well, what they did was they implemented a hello world type of um, code here, as you see, and it just did a simple operating system check, right? To see if it was whether a 64 bit or not. Um, and they did this as a first step to see if the code goes through the SolarWinds pipeline and if it shows the release update, um, and it sure did. So the hello world code was released on October 19th. So this wasn't caught, it looked normal, it looked natural, uh, maybe with some deeper code review, um, this could have been um, seen a little better. Now then a month later, they introduced the malicious payload and then Orion update released on March 20th. Now, here you can see the threat actors added code creating a new threat, calling the backdoor added to the Orion improvement business layer class. Again, it seems like one of their calls, maybe it's, it's formatted the same way. Um, the payload that was consequently downloaded by 18,000 Orion servers and allowed the threat actors initial foothold to FireEye, Microsoft, and potentially many more victims. Now, it is also worth mentioning that the Trojanized update was signed, signed by SolarWinds, making it look completely legitimate and shaking away any signature-based controls. So keep in mind, signature-based you know, signature controls, local privilege so far is what they have. Then, then a month, uh, let's see here, didn't go, there we go. Now, so trying to avoid early detection, okay? So what the code did is after a dormant period of two weeks, the payload starts a few reconnaissance and operational security checks, like we mentioned. One of those checks is to aim to identify endpoint security agents and forensic tools that may expose the running malware, okay? We don't want to get caught here. The malware used a hashed 
hard coded list of roughly 280 agents and tools and compares the current running agents and tools to this list. Now, you can see um, a few of these hashes and associated names here on our list. Uh, once the listed agent or tool is identified, the, mal the malware then will attempt to terminate it, or if it's unsuccessful, terminate itself to avoid exposure and then move on to the next target. Now, when we examined the list, we were able to identify that CyberArk EPM credentials theft component, that's gonna be that CyberNet um, tracker hash here, was listed <clears throat> as part of their checks. Now, analysis of Sunburst code revealed that the malware will terminate upon identifying the EPM component, endpoint privilege manager component. Um, as this component is dug into the operating system and our EPM um, agent has several layers of defense protecting it from even a privileged attacker. So even if I do have say that local admin account um, on that system, well, you're not gonna be able to disable endpoint CyberArk's endpoint privilege manager because of our defense mechanisms. Now, this is not to say that EPM alone could have you know, held the line by itself and stopped the attack in its tracks. However, you know, threat actors, especially nation state actors with elevated privileges, so they had those elevated privileges, would probably find a way um, around it to their intended target. But the above does tell us in that removing local admin from the endpoint and defending against local privilege escalation is critical for other agents, for like EDRs, antiviruses, and so on. Okay, for those agents, um, they run safe. They, you know, for these agents, they run safely, and they'll provide an extra security layer for organizations. So we really need to remove local admin rights. Now, the Sunburst termination also highlights the fact that EPMs sound security posture, in addition to endpoint privilege manager being deployed in a secure manner, has the efficient self-protection mechanisms. So just to highlight that again, even if I have local admin, our agent self-protections will defend against, defend against that. Some EDR and antiviruses tools, not so much. So that's why it's really critical to remove that local administrator from those local systems. Now, returning to the malware execution, if SecOps checks pass, the malware moves on to the last stage, calling back home and starting to dispatch commands from the command and control servers. Now, this stage is actually the first stage of the targeted attack. Usually the first steps of attack focus on privilege escalation and persistence. This case is no different. Though this was an extremely, extremely um, um, complicated um, um, attack, at the end of the day, what were they looking for? Privileged accounts so they can go ahead and elevate and escalate themselves, okay? <clears throat> now, with that, they were able to go ahead, elevate themselves, escalate themselves, and then in a, in very quickly, they were able to go ahead and get those escalation of privileges and then move on with the attack. Now, remember, I do have local administrators. So I have these highly privileged credentials. So then with that, what can I do? Well, I can go ahead and create myself my own golden, my, my own golden SAML credential, okay? So if you're familiar with golden SAML, uh, the golden ticket attack, Golden SAML introduces to a federated environment the same advantages that Golden Ticket offers, okay, in a Kerberos environment. The Golden SAML technique, this allows attackers, once they got that privileged access, again, it starts with privilege, to attack the victim's network, to impersonate almost any identity in the organization and acquire any type of privilege across almost all services in the organization. Okay. Now, this depends on what services and the organizations are using SAML, of course, as their authentication protocol. But now I got 
those credentials, I got that golden uh, SAML a ticket, so to say, and now I can move anywhere within the environment. Heck, I can even start impersonating um, other people or creating new ones. And so, you know, an overview of the intrusion is that, you know, the intruder using administrative privileges acquired an on-premise compromise to gain access to the organization's trusted SAML token signing service. This enabled them to forge SAML tokens, to impersonate any of the organization's existing users and accounts, including highly privileged accounts. So hopefully we're seeing the trend. We're seeing, um, you know, we're hearing that word privileged account. We're hearing uh, administrator. And so again, it's the same, I hate to say the same old story, but it's the same playbook um, at the end of the day. We want, the bad guys want the administrator account, those highly privileged accounts so they can elevate themselves and do damage. Like I said, 18,000 plus organizations impacted. And so if we apply privilege action, action uh, access management to the solar wind spray tool, what does that look like? How could have privileged access um, in our it may perhaps endpoint privilege manager, if you're not familiar with endpoint privilege manager, it's the idea of removing those local admin rights off the workstations, off the servers. And so let's kind of dig in that, uh, dig into that a little bit here. Now, being a security practitioner, I've worked in security for roughly 20 years, is you need to have the right frame of mind. We need to have that assumed breach mentality. So again, as a leader in the identity security space, Cybrec has always taken this position um, of having that assumed breach or that post breach mentality. Organizations need to adopt this um, in this mindset to disrupt attacker progression and escalate breach recovery. So if we take that assumed breach mindset, this enables us and organizations to become vigilant and hyper-focused on addressing weaknesses and vulnerabilities that exist within the environment, especially the areas that provide access to tier zero systems, right? Um, those highly risky, those highly critical systems that quite frankly could bring us down and cause us an outage which equals money, right? So we need to protect those um, tier zero and risky um, uh, uh, assets, okay? Now, the majority of all cyber attacks involve the compromise of identity, manipulation of privileged access. And again, the solar breach is no exception here. Again, we're hearing, the, we're hearing that trend throughout this presentation. Now, what CyberArk can do is deliver deep identity security controls in the expertise that will buy organizations invaluable time in detecting attacks earlier, preventing attackers from reaching their end goals, okay? We wanna go ahead and stop them in their tracks. We wanna go ahead and stop that lateral, lateral and vertical movement within the organization, within the network. So CyberArk believes that a combination approach whereby security, best practices and processes coupled with the right security solutions will best secure highly valuable targets and mitigate risk from advanced attacks like the SolarWinds breach. So identity security solutions offered by CyberArk provide the key capabilities to assist in preventing credential theft, okay, number one. Um, enabling riskware adaptive multi-factor authentication. So think I need to MFA everywhere, okay? Stopping lateral and vertical movement within the network, limiting privilege escalation and abuse, detecting privilege related anomalies and indicators of compromises, those IOCs. So we're gonna be able to go ahead and blanket this with identity and start digging in and protecting those critical assets and credentials. So we wanna go ahead and take a depth and dense, a depth, defense in depth security approach to this, okay? We wanna go ahead and start with locking down endpoint credentials. So again, defense in depth, we're taking that layered approach here, 
locking down those critical um, endpoints and their uh, credentials. We want to go ahead and have that mindset of restricting access to tier zero assets, those highly risky assets, again, we need to protect. You know, think about, hey, if, I have, if I'm on my workstation and I'm RDPing, right, I'm assuming using some sort of remote tool um, to connect to perhaps a database, right, perhaps my company's web servers, any information like that, right, well, guess what? I'm connecting from my workstation, which is quite frankly, a highly sought off target, right? It's sometimes considered a soft target um, because I can remove those local admin rights and start my attack there and start moving laterally and vertically within the company. So we wanna restrict that access. Um, next, we wanna be able to go ahead and detect privileged anomalies. If somebody is using a domain administrator account, root account, sysdba or SA account, okay? Um, without the mechanisms in there, um, that um, dictates how they get it, right? A policy around who can access these and how they access it. Well, I wanna know. I don't want them to cir circumvent any of our security um, solutions that we have in place. And then lastly, you know, think about the code they injected, right? That went through their CI CD pipeline, right? So we need to go ahead and secure that pipeline, remove any of those credentials that may exist in, in hard coded YAML um, type scripts, um, and, and secure the CICD, uh, CICD pipelines and work, uh, workloads. So when we start really talking about um, defense and depth security, we need to implement tight PAM controls and process and, and, and process that and add processes, I'm sorry, to limit that access to that tier zero targets and those risky assets, right? We need to keep safe. And we wanna limit access to those critical resources by prioritizing a PAM solution deployment or validating existing fundamental PAM controls to mitigate significant risk from advanced attacks. Okay. So we need to go ahead, manage those highly valuable credentials uh, and be able to go ahead and audit and dictate who is using and validate who is using those credentials, okay? Next, we wanna go ahead and rotate these credentials regularly um, as often as each individual use and enforce multi-factor um, all around it. So here's that scenario. Now, I spend a lot of my time implementing security tools as well. Um, you know, one of my best practices was as if um, I can have an automated mechanism to rotate my DA accounts, my root accounts, again, my, my SysDBA or SA accounts, then why not do it? Um, so one of my best practices was to rotate these credentials every day. Um, rotate them after use. If my workstation is exploited and someone picks up maybe that privileged credential by dumping the memory and grabbing that hash, well, guess what? It's not going to be valid for much longer, right? Because we're going to rotate it after that use or a set time. Now, multi-factor, we want to think, again, I mentioned multi-factor everywhere. So just because I'm, you know, you know who I am and I'm working on the server, well, if I walk over to my, my vCenter console perhaps and I log in, well, I want to confirm that identity. So maybe I want to go ahead and add some endpoint multi-factor, again, to go ahead and challenge their identity to make sure these people are, are who they say they are. Um, next, we need to enable risk-aware adaptive multi-factor, like I said, but the idea is that we want to go ahead and when we deploy MFA, we don't want to get, how can I say this? We want to bog people down with it. We don't want that MFA fatigue. So what Cyborg has as well is through our UBA, our user behavior analytics, is that we can create smart MFA policies. Um, that way we're not multi-factoring or asking you for an MFA challenge every time, right? We're going to learn how you work. Um, if we notice Rosemary's at the office all day, uh, fine, I'm not going to challenge her maybe. If I notice she moves to Starbucks and well, and maybe she's going to Starbucks every day. Well, there's going to be a learning curve, but after that learning curve, guess what? I'm not going to challenge her when she's at that location either, okay? So around that, then we want to enable strong credential management practices. You know, of course, we want to keep, you know, these things unique. We want to prevent lateral movement. We want to be have... Um, Make sure our credentials are complex because at the end of the day, if I get a hold of that password file, I'm going to go ahead and try to brute force it. So if I, you know, have credentials that 
are named after, you know, my dog or, or something boring like that. Maybe your local sports team is always a favorite. I, when I used to crack passwords, that was one that I would see quite a bit. Um, and so we want to go ahead and frequently rotate these credentials because of they do get into the hands of those bad actors. Now, when we start, talk, start talking about endpoints, well, we want to lock down credentials on the endpoints. And we want to implement privileged escalation and credential theft policies to prevent attackers from gaining administrative access to the environment um, where they can force the attackers to use methods that would expose their presence. So baked into our endpoint privilege manager credential solution is our credential theft blocking capabilities. This is gonna help organizations detect and block attempts to steal Windows credentials. Also any other um, credential stores and any you know, popular web browsers, um, file cache credentials stores such as WinSCP. Um, also, um, the Orion software uses a credential store, which, which I guess has now become popular. Um, so we've added credential theft protection to the SolarWinds Orion software as well. Now we need to implement and re the re implement the removal of local admin rights on critical targets, such as tier zero servers um, and other VMs within our environment. For example, the Orion server, okay. Um, and we need to go ahead and remove those rights and then give them back through policies, right? Again, leveraging Endpoint Privilege Manager's policy creation capabilities. Now, for EPM credential theft rules, right? We're going back to credential theft here a little bit. We did add the SolarWinds Orion software, like I said. Now, the SolarWinds Orion software, again, is that infrastructure monitoring and management platform. If um, you can think back to the sliding beginning, it holds the keys to a lot of those different kingdoms in your in the environment, your network databases, operating systems, et cetera. Wow, that is kind of like a big juicy target if you ask me. Um, and so again, EPM is gonna be able to protect those credential stores. Um, the application, if you didn't know it or not, for Orion, it's gonna store credentials for remote access to all those different platforms like Azure and AWS as well. Um, and so <clears throat> what we wanna do is limit the exposure to those credentials um, because again, for a potential attack, like in this case, we're able to go ahead and get those credentials and then we know the rest of the story. Something also we added because of this breach was our Duo Integration Secrets Dump, okay? Now, the Duo MFA is a two-factor authentication solution for both administrators and users that can integrate with many applications like Windows devices, login, um, Outlook on the web, those OWA and others. Um, the application store stores a secret key that can be abused by attackers to bypass MFA. Now Endpoint Privilege Manager can protect the secrets key from being stolen and the authentication process from being tampered with. This protects all workstations and servers that are leveraging Duo MFA integration. And then next, because of the SolarWinds outbreak, and also I'm gonna make a quick side note here. Think about when the SolarWinds attack happened, we'll say like December-ish, right? Um, these integrations or these new policies have been in the product for a few weeks now, I'll probably say the end of January. So we, our development acted very quickly on this, okay? Um, within, I would say a month, um, and was able to go ahead and build policies and rules um, around that based on this attack. And quite frankly, this is how our Endpoint Privilege Manager development team works, okay? Um, we have a labs group that keeps to either the ground um, that is looking for, listening for any new zero day or threats like this um, so we can go ahead and protect our customers at a moment's notice. Now, the last thing we added that I'll, I'm getting to here, sorry for the delay, is our um, EPM Golden SAML policy. Now, this policy is gonna protect SAML signing certificates and MFA keys, adding an additional control in protecting the secrets of those tier zero assets. Um, this prevents forging SAML tokens in order to access various assets a technique which is highly used 
um, in this reported attack, right? Remember, they're able to go ahead and impersonate other folks and create those new SAML um, tokens. Um, and our CyberX lab um, presented this pot potential of such an attack back in 2007. So if you didn't know it, CyberX, we do have our red team. And we also have our CyberX lab, which I just mentioned like five minutes ago, that is constantly looking um, for attacks, testing the, testing the boundaries, pushing the envelope, um, seeing what they can create, what they can do. And now all that great information and great research is then wrapped up in our solutions. And then akin to that, is we want to, we want to restrict access to those zero, tier zero assets. And now we're starting to kind of move into traditional PAM type functionality. But really in this case, if we isolated that connection, well, guess what? We could have gone ahead and thwarted that lateral movement. Um, so this gives us the ability when we do isolate sessions, we can go ahead and monitor and record privileged activity to those tier zero targets, um, such as Azure AD. Now, privileged session management should be implemented when privileged sessions are used on tier zero targets. Something I used to get a ton of in my implementation days was, do we need to go ahead and have session management to every asset? No, you don't, it doesn't make sense. We wanna go ahead and protect those tier zero targets, those targets that quite frankly, if they were attacked would hurt us really bad, okay? Um, next, we, wanna, we want the removal of restrictions <clears throat> in attempts to access assets from unexpected sources. Um, and so we can detect those, um, exposing that new attacker in the process. <clears throat> so we wanna be able to go ahead and then if we are being attacked, if we if somebody is trying to access, well, then we need to be able and have that, um, that way to detect it. And the threat analytics portion of our privilege access security solution that's baked into it does this. So if there is an unexpected use of a privilege credential, if it wasn't retrieved from our vault, so to say, then we're gonna know about it and alert on that. We can also take actions around that as well. Oh, I need to get rid of this little bar here. Nope. Okay, so I'll just push on with it. I apologize for the bar on top. I don't know how to get rid of it right now. So, we wanna go ahead and detect privileged anomalies. So we wanna be able to identify malicious activities such as credential theft attacks, the attempts uh, of bypassing our cyber our controls, for example. Um, we wanna go ahead, if, if those folks are connecting to targets without checking out a credential from the vault, we wanna alert on it. So we wanna go ahead and detect backdoor account creations, uh, monitor for managed credential use outside of the PAM solution. We wanna establish a normal behavioral patterns of existing users and elevate to stronger authentication when anomalies are detected. Um, so again, if, if I'm doing something outside the norm, this is that built-in um, AI. If I'm doing, outside, doing something outside of the norm, well, then I wanna go ahead, raise a risk level, then maybe next time wanna hit you for some multi-factor to make sure that you are the identity that should be accessing that privilege credential. And then we want to integrate PAM controls with other technologies for detection and response, um, such as a Splunk, um, Exabeam, um, IBM, Rapid7, to aid in detecting potential compromises. Now, it's important that we have a bi-directional data feed, right? So we want to go ahead and if anybody is using these credentials, we want to feed that into our PAM solution as well. And so we get the entire picture of how these credentials are being used. And again, we can apply smart PAM controls then around that kind of user behavior. Lastly, remember I mentioned we need to secure the CI CD pipelines. So privileged credentials are used throughout the software supply chain, integrations with orchestrators and infrastructure managers, for example, your, your Jenkins puppet, right? It's critical in securing that pipeline. So we need to take a holistic approach to secure the supply chain. One, by establishing policies and best practices, okay? Um, control access to the CI CD pipeline um, and development tools. Manage the secrets used by applications to access sensitive resources. And then we need to um, secure, well, 
their endpoints, right? What your developers are working on, okay? That's something that kind of gets missed, right? Um, that's kind of sort of the no brainer here, but we know that oftentimes the, the workstation, the, the endpoint can be that flash point, okay? It sounds cliche, um, but it's the truth. And so, you know, at Cyborg, we, we take identity to be that new border, right? We need to be able to go ahead and just not secure privilege anymore, right? And so Cyborg has grown in a way to identify that, to know that, again, identity-driven security is what needs to happen. And so what we're looking at here is basically our, our, our product portfolio and stack. Um, we have the three main anchors here, access, privilege, and DevSecOps. Now, access, we want to go ahead and start locking down folks from our regular workforce users, those customer identities, right? Uh, I think of it this way, you know, if Sally has access to Salesforce, well, she has access maybe to my client list, my um, price list, right? A lot of sensitive information perhaps. Well, I wanna go ahead and dictate, you know, what application she has access to by leveraging our access portion, but also think about the movers, the levers, the joiners, right? If I change roles, well, my permissions and entitlements should follow me throughout the company. And we're gonna be able to go ahead and provide that layer of security and access, again, based on their role and follow it through their career path with inside their company. Now, when we start talking about privilege, now we're start talking about those, you know, highly sensitive or critical accounts, root uh, data, uh, domain administrators, et cetera, okay? And we wanna go ahead and start with the workstation and server. So our endpoint privilege manager is gonna be that key for that first line defense on the workstations, we're gonna be able to remove that local administrator, right? Now, well, Mike, if I remove that, how can I work? Well, we give back those permissions through what we call policies, okay? And so we can customize those policies for groups, computers, et cetera. The idea is that we don't want to stop how your users work, okay? How you all work. We wanna work with you. So it needs to be frictionless, okay? And it needs to be convenient. EPM's that mechanism to keep the endpoint locked down while still providing productivity for your, um, for your customers and yourselves. Next, vendor privileged access. We need to go ahead and have a mechanism instead of having my vendors and contractors where I have to onboard them, maybe they have, now they're gonna have an instance in AD, right? That's a lot of mess, a lot of work with that. Well, vendor privileged access is gonna be able to go ahead and in a just-in-time fashion, privilege those um, folks access to the particular privilege credential they need. And then when they're done, that just-in-time mechanism is gonna go ahead and deprovision them, okay? So I can provision them within there and then better yet, we deprovision. A lot of people, I know myself, have forgotten to remove contractors and users, right? Next thing you know, you have a pile of them. And again, that's just a huge security hole. Next, on the privilege front, privilege access manager, okay? We have a cloud version in our on-prem, of course. Um, this is gonna be that vaulting, um, vaulting technology, that session isolation that's so critical in safeguarding our tier zero assets and also that password management, right? That's that password rotation we talked about. Now on the right here, our cloud entitlements manager, which is a new offering, is gonna help us root out and dig out, hey, who has access to what in my cloud infrastructure? Yeah, we're, it doesn't make a difference if it's AWS, Azure, GCP, or, or EKS, okay? We're going to be able to go ahead, pull all those entitlements down, right? Who has access to what? Clearly identify and dictate who is an administrator, what entities are what we call shadow admins. Now, shadow admins, think of it as a segregation of duties. Um, maybe I can create accounts, and I can also then maybe elevate accounts, okay? Kind of sort of things you don't want the same person doing, maybe. And we're going to be able to identify those. Something I find interesting in Cloud Entitlements Manager, because we've been talking about identities, and really when you hear, I hear identities, I think of people, right? Flesh and blood. Well, I have um, downloaded and I was implementing some cloud formation templates, okay? These cloud formation templates created some S3 buckets, some uh, roles, um, some other resources within AWS. Well, guess what? When it created those other resources, they left wild cards on things, overprivileged resources. My S3 bucket was wide open to the public. Had no idea. I didn't take the time to go look through that CloudFormation template before I ran it. 
Cloud and Titans manager found it for me. And then lastly, DevSecOps. Again, this is where we want to lock down the CI CD pipelines workloads, right? So we have Secrets Manager um, for our Conjure Enterprise solution. Um, what's great about this is that this is going to go ahead and let you wrap policy in those ephemeral processes, right? Those ephemeral processes that need a highly privileged secret to spin up, okay? So we're going to be able to go ahead and manage those secrets in that highly, very quick, very fast um, um, area of DevOps. And then lastly, secrets management. This is gonna be that same kind of idea, but if I have maybe some homegrown code, I have a hardened, I have credentials within my code. If I'm using vulnerability scanners, right, that are doing a um, authenticated scan in my environment, typically with an admin account, well, I'm kind of, those tools are great, but now I'm leaving that admin hash behind everywhere I scan. So secret management is going to be able to control those secrets, vault those secrets, and rotate the credentials of those secrets when those kind of tools come up and they do their scan thing within that environment. So what we have from Cyborg is our rapid risk assessment and remediation officer offer. Um, you can go ahead and contact myself, Andrew, and we can run what we call our, um, um, our DNA. It's a discovery audit. What this does, it's a free tool. It'll go through your on-prem environment and pick up all those privileged credentials. Um, also, we're gonna give you a lot of information if their passwords haven't been changed, if they're orphaned, um, you know, where they're living. Okay, and then we're gonna be able to go ahead and then give you a risk-based remediation with that. Um, and also then, other things like we have training, vendor assurance, if you're going down that services route, services route, if you need assistance in doing this. But again, this is a free offer. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude by saying thank you. I do appreciate your time and listening to me uh, ramble on. And then, you know, ways to connect with our awesome partner, Asset IT. So I'll turn it over to Rosemary. Yeah, actually, thanks so much, Mike. We do have um, a couple questions that came through so I wanted to address one of them before uh, we close everything out. So one of the questions was, were duo MFA keys com uh, compromised as part of the SolarWinds attack? Do you know yes. that? Yeah, they were. Yeah, and that's why we came out with that specific policy. So what they did was they stored them in that local credential store. So if you're familiar with MFA um, on the endpoint, okay? There, there's an agent, there's something running on there that goes ahead and challenges you um, if you walk up to that vCenter console, right? So it actually lives on there. And so it was able to go ahead and dump that credential store and get it. Gotcha, okay. So thank you for that question um, and that answer. And then we had one other one where it was asking, um, what are some other ways to protect against this type of attack? I think you did cover it a little bit, but if you have any other advice, and then if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, so there's always, you know, we, we've been talking a lot of technology, okay? Um, but also you can always start with the people, right? The people process technology kind of route. Um, have, you know, educate your folks on security, but also educate them, and this is coming from my own personal experience, is educate them on what they need, right? Um, not what they've had in the past. And what I mean by that is I've, wor I've worked in organizations where everybody was an administrator on everything, okay? Did they need it? No. Did they use it? No. Um, if they did, we we're able to go ahead and find out what it was and then through Endpoint Privilege Manager, give them rights to it. But I tell you what, once we removed it, you, you, you thought it was raining frogs from the sky because the people were just outraged. Um, but the reality was they didn't need it. So educating your folks on that and really just giving them what they need um, because no one ever complains when they have too much privilege. Great question. Very true. Um, so one other question that came through is, uh, did they add their own cell number to the MFA to receive duplicate copy of authentication code? I, I would have to dig into that one, exactly how far they took it. Great question. And then, uh, so I guess they can reach out to you after if, if they yes. wanted to have that discussion. Um, one last question 
because we're about time. Um, you talked about how EPM and how the attackers avoid the agent. How is EPM different than other AV or EDR tools? Great. Um, and, and so maybe this is, you know, I'm sure Access IT has had these conversations, but when I have conversations around endpoint, right, I say endpoint and um, I hear, you know, CrowdStrike, um, Carbon Black, or maybe they changed the name by now, I don't know. But, and those are fine tools. Matter of fact, we work with them. We have integrations to Carbon uh, CrowdStrike. But what those tools aren't doing is they're not removing local administrator, okay? You can whitelist all day, you can blacklist all day, you can even gray list all day, right? But if I can still get a hold of that admin account, okay, because you've used it and I find it in the memory of the computer, that's that hash, well then quite frankly, it's not blocking it. And so that's the huge difference. Um, if simply by removing local admin off of the workstations and servers, right, controlling that, you're gonna block roughly, I think the last, number I saw was roughly like 85% of malware because everybody wants, and especially in the soil ones attack, we saw everybody wants that privileged credential, but if I can't get to it, then I, I can't go anywhere. So that's the difference. Right. Okay. Good to know. Thank you for your insights. Um, so I think that's about the amount of time that we have for questions, but anyone can reach out um, as you know ways to connect with Access AT Group. We have some information here. And then we just want to thank um, Mike and CyberArk for participating and um, sharing with us this, this morning. So thanks so much. And also, we wanted to let you guys know that we do have another webinar coming up on February 11th that will be coming out. Um, and you'll get an invite to that from a follow up from this webinar as well. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate all this time. Thank you.